used to, as there's like, oh, you should have sold it, you should have sold it. I'm like, no. If I had sold it, nobody, no, no one would would have ever used it. Because uh, there were other there were other people trying to sell J unit like stuff in .NET back back you know 12, 13 years ago. So uh, a plug for what I'm working on now, not tier three. So I'll plug my open source work. Uh, is Brad Wilson and I, Brad, uh, formerly of the ASP.NET team uh, and MVC, uh, we work on a new tool called XUnit.net. Uh, it's available on CodePlex and soon will be on GitHub instead of CodePlex. But uh, uh, that's a different story. We won't <laughs> talk about that tonight. <laughs> uh, when I was at Microsoft, I, I, I led the team that built the CodePlex site. Uh, Ian worked on it. Uh, a number of people uh, who I work with now, but uh, they've changed management. How about that? So, what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, you know, we have like roughly around 45 minutes. Uh, I'm not going to talk about specific practices, I'm going to talk about the area that kind of exists around the practices and why some of these things are important. Uh, so this is the manifesto for the Agile Software Manifesto. It's, uh, uh, as I've since discovered, it's actually written in very bad manifesto language. You know, there's a manifesto language. This is not it. Uh, individuals, and, and most everyone has seen this, right? I don't need to. Has, there, has anybody not seen this? Okay. Oh. Individuals, interactions, over processes, and tools. Now. We like the stuff on the left. It doesn't mean we don't like the stuff on the right. A lot of people interpret it as we don't like processes and tools. And in fact, many of the people early on in the XP stream programming movement did not like tools. Uh, and the reason why they didn't like tools was tools wanted to own the process. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted you, if you just plug in all the numbers, the tool will manage it for you. Well, software doesn't work like that. Uh, so with tools that support the process and enable the process, okay. Tools that want to own the process, not okay. So think of it like that. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Now everybody who was at this meeting in February in Snowbird was a consultant. Every one of them, that's what they did 24 hours a day. Uh, a lot of things you'll see in here are consultant speak. Uh, so they have lots of like working software, uh, delivering documentation, useless. My, you know, somebody hands me a document, I'm like, well, that's great, I may read it, probably not. I may read a couple pages of it, probably not. Show me working software, I can interact with it, I can do, I can do stuff with it, much better. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation, very specific around the consultants. So. Uh, and responding to change or following plan. Uh, things change. You know, if, you, if you're 12 months into the plan and you're, you're not responding to anything that's happening, you know, the world around you may be telling you something, you're not, you're not doing anything. So what they said was, that is while there is value in the items on the left, we value, or on the right, we value the items on the left more. And the key word there is value. <coughs> What value do you get out of it? Now, I was telling Keith on the way here, who he very nicely drove me here, but um, words matter. So, the Agile Manifesto. Does anybody know what the Agile methods were called before they were called Agile? Spiral. Spiral. Is, that was, that Iter was iterative. Iterative. What was the you know kind of negative term? Anybody know? Pardon me? Hacking. Code and fix. Oh, yeah, code and fix, uh, which we still do today. But, uh, no, they were called lightweight methods as opposed to heavyweight methods like RUM. So, lightweight methods. Well, go back to my consultant thing. Lightweight doesn't sell very well. <laughs> so, agile was born. The word agile is born. Now the problem with the word agile, as I said, words matter, 
is who in here does not want to be agile? Right? What's, what are antonyms for the word agile? What? Smart. Pardon me? Clumsy. Clumsy, rigid, static. You know, if, you, if you'd said, you know, the, the Agile conference is coming up in two weeks, if you said we're going to the rigid conference, <laughs> uh, rigid software conference, uh, probably wouldn't go over very well. But Agile, Agile sells very well. Uh, in fact, you know, Microsoft is, sells software for the Agile business. Uh, now, since everybody wants to be Agile, what's the quickest path to get there? What's the quickest path to, to being agile? Does anybody know? How many people in here do Scrum? So define somebody, and I'm not going to make fun of you, so this is, that's not all. So uh, uh, define Scrum. What is? What are the practices of Scrum? Putting stickies on the board. Putting stickies on the board. <laughs> See, you're you're wary that I'm going to make fun of you. <laughs> uh, no, what are the practices of Scrum? Daily stand-ups. Daily stand-ups. Retro. Retro, agile, you know, retrospectives. Sprints. Sprints. How long are the sprints? Two, three, weeks. Two, three, four. three, two, three four weeks. Varies. One day. Okay, that's it. You're all certified Scrum masters. Um, so. No, you know, they look at the practices. They focus on the practices. Why do you do a daily stand-up? Visibility. Visibility. Learn from others. Learn from others. Uh, if you all sat in the same room, do you need to do a daily stand-up? No. No. Are you still doing Scrum then? Yes. yes. But the <laughs> issue is, is the, the practices are built around this idea of visibility, information, and so forth. Those are the values, not the practices. And my, my biggest problem with looking at agile adoption is a focus on practice and not why you wanted to do that. So there's no, that correlation, uh, which is written about very well in Kent Beck's Extreme Programming book, but it seems to be glossed over because the easiest path to adoption is, un is doing the practices. But if you don't know why you're doing them, you're losing something in the adoption. So how many people in here have company values? Stated company values. Okay, what are, name some of them for me. Integrity. Hmm? Integrity. Oh, one of my favorite Okay. No silos. No silos. Actually, I, I, I like that. You'll have to explain to me why that's a value, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> other ones. Transparency. Just three. There's must be more. Ensuring financial security for people. Ensuring financial security for people. Is that in EN or IN? <laughs> All right, financial security for, for people, the people at the company? Okay. Other ones? Yes. Do less with more. Do less with more. This is right after the layout. <laughs> 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 
And don't worry, the next one is you can do it. <laughs> so, uh, what other ones? Collaboration. Collaboration, I heard innovation. Okay. Any, uh, any other? Yes. Disruptive. Disruptive. Okay. Okay. These are kind of stated company values. Now, I want you to think about what you said before when you said we have stated company values because I'm going to change what I believe the definition of that is, which is we particularly value the following behaviors and skills in our colleagues. We call these our core values, meaning we hire and promote people who demonstrate the following. This is just an example. Uh, so now, if I ask you again, do you have stated company values? Because how they get put into practice matters. Because you can put them up on the board, you can make big signs about them. But if you don't hire people, fire people, promote people based on those, you're not, you don't have values. So now how many people have values? They don't have those values. No, well, they have, so they have different ones. Okay. How many companies do we work for that have those values? How many companies have those values? Not these, not these five, but. So you guys in the back do. So what, were, what are your company's values? So having just read a book called Maverick, which actually is a transparent company, are all your salaries public? No, we, we kind of believe in transparency. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, there are levels of transparency, believe it or not. <laughs> Because, you know, I'll, 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 be, I'll be just as guilty here. One of my company's values is transparency, and no, our salaries are not all published. Um, now, so unless you, unless you kind of take that into practice, they really don't matter. They're just words. Uh, and I pick on words because, and I pick on integrity. Integrity is a good one because, uh, and I don't have it in slide form, but if you ever, if anybody's ever seen kind of Netflix uh, culture and values presentation on SlideShare, uh, so I, if you haven't seen it, I, I suggest you go look at it because it's just fantastic. But the, uh, uh, they talk about, you know, they say, oh, there's these four values, one of them is integrity, collaboration, and, you know, fancy words. And, uh, uh, and then they say, the company that had these on the wall, and integrity was number one, was Enron. <laughs> okay. So clearly there was a disconnect between the words and the practice. Uh, so I, I, I tend to not like words like integrity. I tend to like not like words like collaboration. Um, I do like no silos, uh, transparency. Why honesty? Very hard, you know, you're either honest, kind of. You're either honest or you're not. If you're, you know, you have, if you have integrity, what does that mean? Now, people could interpret that as being honest or straightforward, whatever it might mean. But it, there's an interpretation that goes on, and I don't like interpretation. Yes. I, I'm sorry, but you know the old saying, "Do I look fat in those clothes?" <laughs> <laughs> that means that means that I suddenly fall on the dishonest side because I choose to, to say no. But do I look fat in these clothes? <laughs> no, James, you don't. <laughs> I shouldn't eat the pizza. Uh, <laughs> Honesty is not a black and white thing. I understand that. What, what, I, what, I, what I mean to say is, in, in, in terms of, if you said, if you had to choose between honesty and integrity, which one would you choose? Integrity. Why? Well, we'll have this conversation yes. later. <laughs> uh, now, unfortunately, having values, as I said before, kind of the, the 
how you put the values into practice. Values aren't enough. I can say what they are, but then I have to kind of follow them with action. So let's just get this example. Uh, what is this drivers? What is this referred to as? 10 and 2. 10 and 2. Why do you do it? You're not supposed to anymore. <laughs> Actually, it depends, because it's a consulting answer. It depends. Um, why do you do this? Supposedly you have more control over the wheel. Supposedly you have more control over the wheel. What, what's another reason? Because we were taught. Yeah, this is the way I was taught in driver's ed. Uh, yes. We don't have paddle shifters. I don't have paddle shifters. That's what I mean. Obviously too fancy of a car. <laughs> so the, let's go with the concept that supposedly you have more control over the car. So control is the value. The practice is 10 and 2. Now, why is it wrong? Because you get your arms broken if the airbag goes off. <laughs> like that's unless you got a lot of shoulder flexibility, when the airbag goes off at 10 and 2, your arms get blown backwards. Um, so if your car has airbags, once again, context changes. If your car has airbags, 10 and 2, not a good idea. 9 and 3, 10 and 2, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> Twelve always works. <laughs> this one. This one. <laughs> Just pick the arm that you don't write with. You know, that's the, uh... <laughs> so this is a practice. Uh, the value, in a sense, is we want to be able to control the vehicle. Uh, if you understood the value, I, you know, then if the context changes, the practice can change underneath. And that's, as I said, that's the things that, that bother me about kind of agile adoption, is that if, you, if we just adopt the practice, ten and, you know, rigid kind of, I understand I'm only doing 10 and 2, the world around me changes, I don't react. Make sense? So in Ken Beck's book, it's the XXD book, values are large scale criteria to judge what we see, think, and do. Uh, and value brings purpose to practice. It is the reason why we do these things. Vice versa, practices are clear, they provide evidence that we have these values, and they bring accountability to the value. So you have to actually have to have both. Uh, for a successful kind of agile adoption. And they really need to be in balance, as opposed to launching the practice of this. But the, um, so questions on that before I jump into XP balance. Okay. Uh, these are extreme programming values, communication, simplicity, feedback, courage. Now, some of you will notice there's some words in there like you know, that maybe aren't very straightforward. So simplicity, simplicity is a value. Uh, and the practices that kind of make up that value, incremental design, user stories, weekly cycles, these are the practices that underlie simplicity. Can you talk some more about simplicity in a minute? Yes. Yagni also. Yagni, you are going to need it. Mm -hmm. It's more of a philosophy. It's well, but it's about simplicity. But it's a practice. You don't over-design. Yes. I, I would put that in incremental design, but that's good. Communication. Uh, what, does, what does it mean to say that I value communication? Because the lack of communication, I mean, if we go to the kind of black and white, the lack of communication uh, is pretty obvious. I don't value lack of communication. Now, XP, if you look at these practices, sit together, whole team, informative workspace. Uh, they valued high bandwidth communication. That's what they valued. They wanted everyone in here. Maybe not all of this many people, but uh, uh, they wanted everybody to sit together and work on the project because they valued high bandwidth communication. Um, 
it didn't necessarily mean that it, it said I favor high bandwidth over low bandwidth freely. So. Feedback. Test first programming, incremental design, 10 minute build, continuous integration, once again, weekly cycles. Uh, these are the practices that enable us to get feedback. Uh, how many people in here do test first? <laughs> Hmm. Hooray! <laughs> what well, I, I tell this story because uh, the reason why NUnit was written, another reason why I didn't want to sell it, uh, was the reason why NUnit was written was my goal was not to be in the developer tools business, which is a really lousy business. Uh, it might be okay for Microsoft or someone else, but it's not okay to sell an individual tool. My goal was to get people to do test-driven development. That was really the goal. I mean, we, when I worked at ThoughtWorks at the time, uh, my, my goal was uh, we were transitioning from a Java shop to uh, Java and .NET, and I wanted the same environment in .NET that I programmed in Java. Hence why I needed was. So the goal was really to do test-driven development. Uh, and test first. Once again, kind of wording problem, but uh, whatever the case might be. But really, the idea is, how do you get feedback into the development process? You can wait. You can deliver the thing to test and wait and get feedback. Uh, the story I always tell is, uh, uh, when I worked at Object Mentor, uh, one of my consulting projects was the Xerox DocuCenter copy. Uh, and if I had actually worked for Xerox, I'd own the patent, or I'd be on the patent for the thing that allows it to scan and print at the same time. Which, uh, interestingly enough, is a computer science problem. Uh, it's a virtual memory problem, is what it is. Uh, and one of the problems they had was to get feedback, they would work on something, and they'd get feedback two weeks later. They'd be working on something, and then two weeks later, they'd be like, okay, we finally got it through our test, and test for them generated mountains of paper. Mountains, I don't, literally mountains of paper were generated, because test, all they did is they had people, uh, they were called key operators, I don't ask me why. Uh, they would run jobs through the copy all day long. It was an exciting, exciting job. And it never crashed. They would they would do like a core dump basically of the system, and then say I ran job 47 and it crashed. Now the problem is the thing is ent entirely non-deterministic. So I could run job 47 through the thing 50 times and have it not fail, and then the 51st time it might fail or the next whatever. It's entirely non-deterministic. Uh, so the fact that they would send us this stuff would be like whatever, because it really made no difference. <laughs> uh, but they did generate lots of people. Uh, so, <clears throat> feedback is critically important. What happens when you have too long of delay in feedback is you have to rebuild the context. So, if I can say I can make a change and seconds later I can get feedback, I, I probably remembered what I was doing. Hopefully, unless I was distracted. Uh, if it was two weeks ago, I guarantee I have no idea. None. To this day, I couldn't tell you what I did two weeks ago. Uh, I have to think about it and try and rebuild. Okay, two weeks ago, that was. Yeah, what is that? I don't, I don't think it's just a matter of waiting two weeks and not knowing. I think it's a matter of not knowing for two weeks. Well, exactly. I, I mean, yes. it's just mm -hmm. being totally out of control. Right. Uh, so the goal with XP was to shorten that feedback cycle. Better. And that feedback cycle is pervasive throughout the process. I, I have a, I can, as a developer, I can get instant feedback. Uh, I can do continuous integration and do a 10 minute build. And the reason why it was called 10 minute build is if it's anything longer than 10 minutes, you're going to do something else. If it's less than 10 minutes, you might wait. Uh, if it takes 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you're going to build up work and to wait till that happens. If you can, if you can do it in 10 minutes, you're more likely to do it.
for the longest time, and I, and I, at Object Mentor, uh, we built a class with Kent Beck and Martin Fowler and Ron Jeffries to do XP immersions. Um, to take a, a group of people who'd never done XP and run them through five days of, of whatever and outcome, you know, they could, they could theoretically do XP. Uh, I could never explain why courage was one of the values. The longest time, I could, I could never do it. And, and what, what I've come to kind of describe here is that the ability to share information requires courage. Negative information. Any information. I mean, it's easy to share positive information, although some people have a hard time. Like if you listen to the people that work for me, I really don't share positive information. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about me that doesn't like positive information. Uh, So it's easy to share, it's, it's theoretically easier to share positive information, it's harder to share negative information. Uh, so it takes courage to say to someone, this isn't working, we need to change, whatever the case might be. Or also, to kind of, if you think about informative workspace, you walk into the space and it tells you everything that's going on. I can look around, I can see what's going on, whatever the case might be, it takes courage to do that. And the hope that, or the belief, not hope, because uh, hopefully it's more than hope, the belief that they won't use the information incorrectly or use it against you. Uh, how many people work in that environment where they can literally share everything about the project without fear that somebody might say something? That, see, that's pretty good. I mean, that's, I, if I asked that question 10 years ago, they, there wouldn't be anybody. Now, maybe there'd be a couple people. Uh, I'll use the Xerox project again. Uh, we sat, I, since I was a consultant, I could kind of like sit on the sidelines and like observe. And uh, they used uh, management by, uh, I called it like chicken. So the managers would sit in this room and they'd say, are you gonna be on time? And all of them would say yes. And it'd be like a okay, useless conversation. They'd all say yes. And as we get closer and closer and closer to the delivery date, you know, it'd be yes with sweat. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're gonna make it. Yes, yep, no problem. We're gonna we're gonna get there. Uh, and then, you know, literally like a week beforehand, somebody couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> okay, and then <laughs> dead. Okay. <laughs> they're gone. Okay, they're the, this. This was how this was. How, and you think I'm kidding? No, this is how they manage this group. Uh, the the person who run, ran the group, the chief engineer responsible for all of them, they. This was a job that you got fired from. And this guy got fired three days before the thing launched. Uh, so they particularly didn't like him. Uh, so in that era, in that scenario. Sharing information was the wrong thing. Because if you shared early on, then you took the brunt of, of what was going. So it takes courage to do that. It takes courage to work with someone. Uh, any people who pair program? Not so, now. Not now. So you gave it up? Well. You work by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> But I did six years of XP. Okay. Early on, people were really nervous. A lot of, lot of introverted people in the, in the programming world. Uh, maybe even drawn to it. Uh, to say, now you're going to work with other people? Martin, Martin Fowler used to say, the, uh, you know, how you could tell the extroverted introvert was he knew he or she knew what color your shoes were. Okay, so now they're like, open up the door. Um, but that's okay. So, uh, energized work. One of the, you know, worked in so many projects that were a nightmare. So this, this, um, the Xerox one's a special nightmare. Uh, it's hard to look back on and say it was awful because I, I was a consultant, I got paid lots of money. So the people that worked there was horrible. Uh, they were demanded that they work on Saturday. 
They were not paid to work on Saturday. They demanded that they work on Saturday. Uh, so they had to work on Saturday. The boss would walk around and check who was there. Uh, now, they didn't do anything. The people there didn't do anything. They sat and did the things that they would normally do on Saturday at work. Uh, but they had to be there. If they weren't there, bad things happened to them. So it's important from a standpoint of, and I'll talk about this in a second, the ability to sustain what you're doing is critically important. I, I don't want well, this amount of effort and then nothing. You know, this amount of effort and nothing. And one of the issues with waterfall was that, right, which was during the analysis phase, the design phase, you know, you were on vacation mentally because you had to be, because you were, you, you knew what was coming, right? The 60, 70, 80, 90 hour weeks, on and on and on, just to deliver the thing. Uh, this was the vacation from that. Uh, now, what XP kind of did was say, and XP and Agile in general was, let's smooth it out. Now, smoothing it out has another problem, which is it is unrelenting. It is always on. Uh, one of the guys that uh, worked for, I had a team in China, previously right before I left Microsoft. Uh, he'd, he'd been on Windows. So you can imagine, you know, Windows development cycle, not a lot of work goes on, planning and whatever else, and then hell for a long period of time and then it stopped again. Uh, he complained to his manager and said that he'd never worked so hard in his life that the six months that he worked on this project. And when I, I went over there and kind of talked to him and said, well, what, what is it about? Because I want to understand. And his, his answer was, there is no downtime. There, there is no downtime. It is unrelenting. So there are ways around that. As I said before, I, I have a problem with words. And this one in particular. So what is simple? Does anybody know? Not complex. Not complicated. OK, that's a good one. Uh, I did look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> So 
This building, which is one of his most famous buildings, he has a question. No, okay, sorry. Uh, one of his more famous uh, residential buildings, because he actually was uh, designed many uh, tall buildings. Uh, this building is actually incredibly difficult to build from a structural standpoint. It doesn't look very complicated, but it is. Uh, same thing if you looked at the iPhone five years ago. It's relatively simple, really complicated. The approach, though, would not be described as simple. You wouldn't describe the iPhone as simple or this building as simple. Uh, but I feel the word minimalism kind of transfers better into what we're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to come up with something that has all of, you know, kind of stripped down to its smallest set of features. What's the most important thing that we have to develop? Not, you know, not simple. So I think it translates a little bit better. So these are my agile values. So if I could go back, you know, 14 years and describe it this way, this is how I would describe it. So minimal, minimalism, as we just talked about, discipline. Uh, someone mentioned code and fix earlier. Uh, code and fix is not a discipline process. Actually, the way that people described XP, they described it in a way that made it sound undisciplined. And in fact, it's more disciplined than anything else I have ever programmed. So it's, it's the opposite of undisciplined. Uh, Reality-based and sustainable. And I can find, Ian, is there a way to get, get people these? I could post them somewhere. We'll figure it out. Uh -huh. Yeah, Ian, you want to talk Now, which practices make up minimalism? Incremental design, user stories, minimum viable product, I'll steal the fancy term, lean startups. Uh, weekly cycles, that's what we're trying to achieve. Those are the, that's the value. These are the practices that bring that bring that to you. Discipline, test first programming. A lot of people, a lot of people in here have used test first, test driven. Uh, would you describe that as an undisciplined activity? No. Uh, in fact, it's really hard. I mean, early on, it's like, this is crazy. Who would think of this? Uh, Ten minute build requires a lot of discipline. You have to kind of be constantly thinking about, well, if I write tests, how long they're going to take. Uh, once again, it kind of filters all the way through the development process. I liked reality-based because communicate, as I said before, communication doesn't sit well with me because I can't define it. Uh, so I like to live in the real world. I think that answers your question about, well, maybe it doesn't answer your question about honesty. Because uh, maybe you'd be t saying you wouldn't want to hurt their feelings. Uh, sit together, whole team, informative workspace, collective ownership. Uh, we all work on the same thing. We're all there together. We're there to achieve what we need to achieve. Uh, and we live in the real world. We talk about it as, we're, as if we're in the real world. There's no hidden agenda. There's no, I, if I hide things from you, I get a 4.5 or a, what is it now? I, I get a 1 now if I, you know, and so it's, uh, I heard something the other day, that's why I was trying to think of it, was, uh, uh, has anybody read the book Tribal Leadership? Uh, so Tribal Leadership uh, talks about uh, different stages of kind of team development. And, and I believe Microsoft is, is stuck in like stage three, which is I'm great and you are not. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, if I can make it, make, make it aware to everybody else that you're not, that's even better. Uh, so there's no hidden agenda, you know, the review systems, whatever, they all play into, you know, how we kind of eventually stack rank people and whatever. Uh, so the idea that we live in the real world, we don't, we don't do that. We don't have, we don't have hidden agendas. We don't, we try and work on the same things with the same information that everybody else has. Sustainable. I talked about energized work. Uh, the big thing here is Slack. Is do you schedule all of your people 
to 100% of the time. And Eric, please don't say that. <laughs> uh, there is a time and place, but uh, it is critically important that you don't schedule everybody to every minute of the day. When I, what I said before about this kind of unrelenting pace, uh, if you schedule people to 100%, you know, no one's estimates are perfect, things happen, whatever the case might be, at a hundred, if you schedule to 100%, there is no slack. So what happens then is weekends, nights, whatever the case might be. And, and, and I, I always say that working overtime multiple weeks in a row is not a programmer problem, not a developer problem. It's a management problem. Uh, they believe the team can achieve more than it actually can achieve. And they're willing to commit the team to do that. That's a management problem, not a development problem. So, okay. Yes? So do you suggest using the Slack time as a buffer for work? Or do you really? No, I, because there's two reasons why you would use Slack. Well, one is you should never schedule your team to 100% flat out. Um, we live in a business that if you ask everyone in here, who, what they programmed on five or six years ago is probably different than what they program on now. If you take their time and devote it entirely to the work that they're working on, they have to ignore the world around them. Or they spend time at home or weekends, whatever the case might be, uh, not developing their craft. And eventually, the people will become less valuable. Because it's important that they understand the world around them. I mean, one, of the, uh, one of the people that Chris and I know, uh, one of their critical review characteristics is, uh, is how aware they are of the world around them. Even though they might work at Microsoft or whatever the case might be, how aware of the world, of, you know, like, are they learning things? Uh, it's, it's, you have to do that. As a developer, you have to keep up. Uh, so what I would suggest from a Slack perspective is that's the keeping up part. Uh, I, I did this on a, a team at Microsoft. Uh, what came out of it was the, uh, um, the SVN bridge, the, the subversion bridge to TFS. was a Slack project at Microsoft. Xunit.net was a Slack project at Microsoft. Um, a number of other ones that didn't didn't necessarily make it to kind of fruition, but they don't necessarily have to. Uh, now, I, I didn't want somebody you know doing something that was more you know, kind of orthogonal to work. Uh, and I did this a couple different ways. One is you could take one day off a week or one week off a month. Most people took one day off. Now, Google does this, uh, and I know Gregor, oh, Gregor and I used to work, Gregor Hopi and I used to work together. He took one week off a month because he, that's what the amount of time it took him to focus on something. Uh, this is important for, from, a, from a, a developer kind of growth perspective. I think this is critically important. Now, I'll say that and say the environment that I'm in right now, probably difficult stuff. <laughs> Yes. I think if you look at human performance, the more that you expect them to perform something extraordinary, the more time between those beats that you need to give them. So if you take a professional athlete as one extreme, they have a whole off season in which to train their body to go back to sure. mm -hmm. perform. Yes. Mm -hmm. And at the other end of the scale, we have somebody who's doing a repetitive task that requires no brilliance, perhaps. And yep. so if mm -hmm. you think about software somewhere on a continuum. That's somewhere in there. That's a good I, I like that. Yes. And also, there's uh, the matter of refactoring your code. Oftentimes, you write the code to work, right? Then, oh, the, the time, we hit the time. I don't have time to refactor, or, and then you just move on, and then you start accumulating a lot of these things. Te technical debt. Technical, <laughs> technical debt, right? So, yeah, right. <laughs> and with that, then, you know, do, you know, should it be part of that 80% time, you know? Or should it 
to refactor be part of the 20%? So, uh, for me, refactoring is part of the 80% time. Okay. Uh, why? Because it's like, a, I, I, I view that refactoring is part of your job. Yeah, your you know, kind of developer's job is is uh, keep keep the code clean, we used to, to say. In, uh, uh, and the restaurant term is clean as you go. And the reason why is if you accumulate a bunch of stuff in the restaurant, somebody, you know, the bus rolls in. I, I don't have dishes, I don't have this. It's like, it's, it's very obvious why you might do kind of clean as you go. Uh, that's the same thing I think of with the code. Uh, is there will be times where you'll have to make trade-offs to say, I need to make this, I need to get this done. <clears throat> And I'll live with the downside of technical debt. Uh, you do it too often, the thing tips over at some point, and, and you can't live with it anymore. Uh, and then you know, you, you, then you start talking about I need to rewrite all this because it's uh, no good anymore. And, and of course, we're never given the time to rewrite it. Uh, so those those things have to happen as we go. It's hard to ask management say, oh. Although it's working, but I need more time to, you know, kind of clean it up. Yeah, so the, what, what, I, what, the, what I do from a strategy perspective there is, is uh, and in some ways people interpret this as kind of an uh, aggressive approach, so I'll, I'll preface it with that, is they, no one stands over you and says, why did you use a for loop there instead of a while loop? They'd be like, <laughs> you know, um, I think you should just write it. Okay, if you want to be in that level of detail, fine, go ahead. Isn't that what pair programs are Management. So if someone from management comes in and says, oh, I think, you, you know, no one says that. What, what they might say is, how long is it going to take you? And your answer should be, how long is it going to take me to do the job that, I, that I'm going to be proud of? And if, the, if that answer is too long, they can go find somebody else. And... And so I, I think you have to have that kind of mentality which says, this is how long it's going to take me. You know, you can tell me to do it less and whatever else, I'd like, but you're not giving me any strategies about how to do that. Yes? Now, these, are, these are slack time ones that are assigned, or are these slack ones that you come up with? And no, these are, these are personal projects, whatever they want. Oh, you like. chose them. Nope, I don't choose them. Oh, so individual, no, individual person, does. I yes. chose to do them, or? The individual. The individual the chooses them. Yes. So this is a very individual uh, task. Does this conflict with a team? I've got four developers working at the same time. If one developer can't work today because he's got his slack time. Isn't that, does that seem disingenuous to have a team work together on a particular sprint, for example? But we all, we all you could take it to that level. Uh, but we also have, we have different times of the day when people work. Some people like to work in the morning, some people like to work in the afternoon. Your example will take off a week. <laughs> yeah, a week is hard. A week is hard. That's why I said I think most people don't do that for that for that particular reason. So but even just take off Monday, once a week. Yeah, so at, in, in each one of our iterations, we used to say which day it was. So they knew that that person wasn't there that day. Uh, isn't any difference in being sick. <laughs> right, or on vacation or whatever else. So yes. there is a um, there's an RSA talk that's animated by Word Talks called What Motivates Us that actually discusses this whole idea of slack time. Um, and there's evidence to suggest that as you increase pay with people, they're, they're kids of point where there's diminishing returns. You're paying them more, but not being more efficient. And in fact, there's even a, a, a trend downward in efficiency after a certain level of pay. And it was talking about the idea of giving employees the opportunity to do what they want, like the slack time idea, and how that actually is a compensation that can re-energize people and increase productivity again. Um, so that is that is a possible set of evidence if you want to sell the practice to management. It's, I, I believe it's called What Motivates Us, um, if you just Google. Sure. Okay. Well, there's a whole data pain, right? Um, yes, Well, there's it also um, the Management 3.0 book, which talks a lot about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Um, interesting kind of ideas about what, what truly does motivate you. I mean, it's once you, you know, so the, the concept is, and I think this is what you're getting at, but once you hit some threshold of money, there are few individuals that who want to accumulate kind of massive wealth. But for most people, there's a threshold that they cross. And once they cross the threshold, more doesn't necessarily 
translate into more motivation. It's like I've, I've satisfied kind of basic need A, you know, unless I need the private plane, you know, whatever. Um, so these, were, these are the four that I came up with. Uh, the reason why I like these is I, I tend to think I don't have to explain them like I had to explain XPs. Uh, skip that. Uh, so what I would, I would encourage you to do uh, is, is kind of understand what, uh, what your engineer, you know, we talk about kind of company values. Uh, I'd like you to think about what your development process values. And at times, like I, I, I teach at the University of Washington once a year, uh, and we do this as a workshop in class, and, and it is truly the most depressing hour <laughs> of the day, of the whole course, because they're like, really, what does it value? And, and if you start describing what it values, and you think like that that is really it it's like okay i don't i don't want to work there anymore and a number of people have like one thing that so um, so i want you to think about what your current development process values and if it's not the right one change it uh, i used to think you know with xp xp requires organizational change to be effective i used to think that i could kind of focus on the development practices and not worry about it. And you know, that, that got us like this far into the process. And then it said, you know, we really need, we really need the, you know, the product, you know, the stakeholders to start thinking in smaller increments. We really need them here. You know, it, and at some point in time, the practice approach broke down. And we needed to change the entire organization. Uh, once you understand what the practices, you know, kind of what your values are, map them to what practices. They are. So don't think about practice first. Think about values first, and then the map to practice. Yes. So just to uh, uh, practices kind of are a means to realize the values. There's another dimension that I think practices are, and in every in every dev organization, there's a huge uh, spectrum. Of I think in some ways, practices, uh, rather than trying to a way to get everyone to do the right thing, they can in some ways be a way to prevent certain... You know, so prevent, yes, prevent disaster, yes. And I think that's a, a dimension to practices as well, that's, you know, other than just realizing, like, the standard set of values, kind of... So I, I, the way I would think about that is, is conformance to those standards has to kind of fa factor into your values. Because if that's important, I mean, one we're going through right now is SSAE level two, I forget, level two, or something like that. Um, we have to do that. And we have, we have HIPAA issues, we have, and we have all kinds of uh, issues that we have to deal with. They have to kind of filter into our values. It's something that we value, something that we think is important to our customers. Um, and then we have to have practices that allow us to pass those audits. Um, you know, the, the worst thing is to say, I've got to pass, you know, so I'll go back in history, ISO 9000. Uh, and the company I worked at, the, if you read, I, well, in some cases, read ISO 9000, said, here, describe the process and show me that you did it. That's like the, the, the 100,000 foot level of it. Um, there's no way we did it, but we passed the audit. Because <laughs> um, so, the goal was to pass the audit. Xerox, Xerox wanted to be CMM level three. It was written into the manager's commitments that they would become CMM level three. We were CMM level three. We, I mean, if you read the book, we weren't, but we passed the audit. Uh, so that's an example, I think, of, you know, if the goal is really just to pass the audit, you can pass the audit. If you want to believe from a value perspective that being com in compliance with, you know, kind of the spirit of the audit as opposed to the detail, uh, then it would be a value. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I guess I, you know, I just think, of, you know, first, 
you know, consider what your values are. Secondly, you know, consider the context in terms of the, the, the people and the resources that you have and what are, like, you know, how closely do they naturally um, um, you know, fit into those values and then decide what the practices that you need to put in place. Yes, that's a perfect summary. <laughs> you just said that <laughs> uh, This is my email, jim.newkirk at 2 or 3.com. Uh, if you do email me, I do eventually respond. Uh, it may take a few days, but I do eventually respond. Uh, and then I occasionally tweet it, James. Uh, with that, Thank you very much. And any more questions? Yes? How did this translate to the individual developer and the management team? I'm sorry, let me come back. This is kind of rough, but how did this translate to an individual developer? Sure. Uh, so how does this translate to an individual developer? This was not what I thought of. I think, you know, I, I said early on, it says, you know, what do you value? You as a person, you as your team, and you as your company. And I think of those things as three different things. Uh, now, hopefully, there's alignment. If there's not alignment, what do you do when there's not, you know, like, if you don't, if you disagree with what the company does, there's a, there's a, uh, a thing that happens, which is, like, I don't agree with what they do here. So what should I do? I should either change how they do it or leave. So I don't, I don't particularly view, I, I view individuals that they have to actively change the environment around them. If you don't like the way that things work, you have to actively try and do something about it. And if you don't want to do anything about it there, go somewhere else. But it's not okay to, you know, my life sucks. I mean, every, every day, my life sucks, right? That, it is not okay. And, and you think you do good work in that environment? I, I'd be surprised. Uh, so I, I think how does it translate to you know to an individual is you need alignment of your values with the companies, and if you think they're out of alignment, you have to do everything you can to try and change them. And if you're not willing to do that, go do it somewhere. Uh, it's as I said, not okay to kind of just sit back and say this is crap. I don't you know like. Uh, <laughs> I had many times at Microsoft, my teams at Microsoft had horrible, uh, called uh, MCI. So we got, we got polls every year that all of the employees would take these polls and they would come back with, uh, we get results, you know, lots of tables, Excel, you know. Uh, and my teams had terrible Microsoft culture index. All of them were not living, not going to be at Microsoft longer than a year. <laughs> and uh, were, you, were you in those results too? Oh yeah, I was in there too. So, <laughs> I decided to stay every September. If you know anything about, if you know about anything about Microsoft's pay system, you know, I understand why that's the case. Um, Andy Lees, who used to be in charge of Windows Phone was my manager. And, and he said, uh, and I, I said, you know, I kind of lived the, I described this as like the counterculture. So we ran kind of the open source stuff at Microsoft. It was obvious to me that the people that I would hire didn't like Microsoft. This was especially in 2003, 2004. It's like, if you would like open source and you worked at Microsoft, people were like, what? Why would you do that? And uh, why, what we're trying to do is we're trying to change the culture. Uh, now, were we successful to some extent? Not to a lot of extent, but uh, uh, so and, and there with Andy Lee's and Andy says uh, he's like, you know, your team has terrible Microsoft culture index, you know. But I had uh, the other numbers were really good, and 
And I, I said, oh yeah, it's because, uh, um, you know, kind of the culture of our team and whatever else. He goes, that's a bunch of, well, I will tell you what he said. But uh, that, that's not true. He said, I bet you badmouth Microsoft all the time. And I said, oh, there must be mics in my office. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so either, so the, long story short, we were trying to change the way Microsoft worked. We didn't like some of the things that Microsoft was doing, we didn't like what they were doing in the open source space. We were trying to change it. Uh, we got to a certain point and it became what, you know, what we could do, we did. Uh, and then it was time to do something else. So. Uh, you know what we'd have liked it. We would like to have, you know, had my I need to uh, use the render, you know, use WebKit. You know, was that ever going to happen? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, question. Could, could you address what you think a uh, high developer turnover at a company suggests? Uh, well, there's there's lots of so the question is uh, what is. High developer turnover suggests. Uh, on one level, I could say that there's probably not a line, not a great alignment between uh, what the individuals think and what how the company's being run. Uh, but there's so many other factors. Uh, one of you know, high develop you know, this the uh, cl the cloud space at the moment. Uh, there are a number of people, number of different companies in Seattle hiring developers who understand the cloud. And it's like a roller coaster in terms of the salaries. Uh, so I could say, you know, there's high develop, you know, high turnover uh, could be related to the fact that there's lots of opportunity. You know, I, I can go work at Amazon. I can go work at, I can, but uh, uh, I can go work at Google. I can go work at Microsoft. Whatever the case might be, uh, there's lots of opportunity. And in lots of opportunity, you will see turnover. Uh, and as a manager, you know, my job is to, is to make sure that, uh, you know, people feel like they're being rewarded, people feel like they're being valued uh, all the time. I mean, it's not, well, not, with, not when there's, you know, lots of opportunity, less of whatever the case might be. Uh, so there's lots of dimensions to that. I, uh, Microsoft for a while had, had pretty high turnover numbers when they started laying off people. Uh, and a lot of people would suggest that they broke a uh, trust level, which was there was never any layoffs at Microsoft. Uh, not, you know, lots, three percent percentage ones. But uh, uh, once they did that, then the association of, lo you know, the loyalty kind of equation didn't start being in question. It's like, why should I be loyal to you if you're not going to be loyal to me? So you start getting that, it's yet another reason for so there were spikes in turnover after Microsoft's layoffs in 2008, 2009. Hmm? Loyalty is a value. I'm, I'm sorry. Loyalty is a value. Loyalty is a value, yes. So you either value, if you don't value it, or you don't know when you when you hit the tipping point in terms of breaking it, you won't know. Or you'll know later on when downstream somebody says, you know what, I'm leaving now. So identifying values and practices, that's what we talked about. So values are agile values. Practices are really kind of the religion that XP is, uh, yes. Scrum is. Mm -hmm. So um, are we fighting the same fight? And if I'm a true believer, and I have the agile spirituality, <laughs> we don't do Scrum, and that works for my team, what is, I guess, what's your thesis there? What are we saying that if I don't necessarily do all the practices, we our team also believes in the values. I would say that if you believed in the values and did every practice different, then then I think you are true to your team. The, the the problems we ran into early on were were dogma related, which is do all twelve. If you didn't do all twelve, you weren't doing XP. Now the the problem with not doing what the problem the the reason why I think, and you guys follow Ron Jeffries, so Ron Jeffries is 
probably the most vocal person here, which was, you know, he would say, uh, he would sit there and listen to people and say, you know, they go along, you know, we don't think pair programming work in this environment and that's continu you know, continuous integration, no, no, not so much work. You know, we work on big projects and blah, 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 whatever. And he'd sit there and listen and go, that's really interesting, why don't you try it my way and we'll find out. Um, and so there was a lot of dogma. And the reason why there was dogma was you didn't know, or we didn't know, when it broke. It sure looked like those 12 things worked together, but we didn't know when they, if you took three of them out, would the whole thing fall apart? Uh, which in some cases it would. Uh, so we didn't know that. So the answer was dogma. <laughs> uh, but if I think if, if, one of the kind of things I take away from Agile is empowering the team to do the right thing. And if you can align the team around values, say these are the values, Figure out what the right thing is. I'm not going to tell you it's a daily stand-up. It's, you know, ship every week. Now, if you come back to me and say, uh, we've just, we decided to ship every three years, I'm going to be like, oh, I don't think that's going to work for me. But uh, uh, So I think there's boundaries. I think you set up a system and kind of describe the constraints that the system would apply. And then say, you know, the rest is up to you. You have to figure it out. Uh, but I want you to kind of live in, in this kind of system. Uh, and then, you know, people are more, I, I just find that the more prescriptive you are as a manager, the less empowered the people that work for you are. Because it's, everything is your decision. Uh, and if that's the case, well then, you know, at the end of the day, they're, you know, you're going to get people who only want to work in that environment. And then you'll be, as the manager, going, oh, they don't think on their own. It's like, yes, because you have thought for them, okay? And they don't know how to do it. So you feel like making 4,000 decisions a day? No, I don't. I, I joked the other day that uh, I had to make a decision and I had to go home because that was my allotment for the day. Um, <laughs> so I think, you know, empowering the team to do the right thing, critical, critical for agile development. Uh, being prescriptive about 12 practices. You know, I, I, the teams that I've had, uh, they're not religious about pair programming. There are things that are pair programmed. This is in the past, maybe today. The team I have now, a, a fair number of them pair programmed. But uh, to sit there and do web pages, you know, the same type of web page over and over, to have two people do it is not is a waste of time. Critical design areas, Aspects of the system, two people work on, great. That's got to be new. Uh, even if we're reworking parts of it, like we're saying, we take one aspect of the system and kind of rework it, I want more than one set of eyes on it. Translated? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, refactor. Yeah, refactor it or, or whatever. Yeah. But that's not refactoring. Refactoring is kind of, uh, if I'm being you know, kind of pedantic about the word, it just says we're making the internal structure better without changing its external function. Uh, in some cases, we may be, like the example that I'll use right now is we're kind of reworking how our role system works in our product. That's not, you know, it's redesigning how we might do that. Uh, there are aspects of it that might be refactored, but this is kind of changing its function. There was other question? No? Anything else? Yes? How have you, uh do you have much experience or suggestions for uh, like scaling up? Like, let's say instead of at the lower team level, uh, the team of like say, 10 people, let's say uh, 20 teams of 10 people. How does the team, the organization, serve uh, uh, being, the I mean, team organization being at the metal level, the, the layer where I love the team or the team? So the question was about the team of teams. Like how does, in, in some in some ways, I'll, I'll think of it as how does Agile scale? And in some respect, and it's really more like how do Agile, or how do small teams scale? Because in the reality is, you know, I used to, I used, if I go back, so I've been doing this 30 years, so, you know, uh, I used to think I could do it all by myself, really. I did. 
Um, and then I found that there were problems that were too big to solve by myself. And then I needed other people around. Uh, I'm always going to bias it towards a smaller team. Uh, that said, there are problems bigger than 10 people can solve. And then the question is, how do you manage that? Uh, so the, the approach that is always suggested was scrum of scrums, you know, team of teams, whatever the case might be. So you have a team of 10 people or whatever the number, another team of 10 people, another 10 people, you know, and then you figure out at some high level who gets assigned what, who gets assigned this, who gets assigned this, and then you somehow have to bring that together. Uh, I, I've honestly never seen it work very well. Uh, I've seen people attempt, you know, and, and the problem is, is, is how can you split it? Now, if you can easily kind of split it and come up with decent interfaces and, and uh, so that what we did is with our, because the team I had in China, uh, so there's, there are people in China, there are people here. Uh, what we did is we would write, uh, this would be no surprise thing. We write unit tests that described the interface. And we would run them, and if the thing didn't work, then it'd be like, go fix those, because this is what we're depending upon. Uh, did that. But you know, it required a significant amount of effort to figure out what the team in China was going to do versus the team in right. user interface or some other you know, um, so now you get one of my pet peeves. Okay. okay? Um, I believe in developing vertically, which is user interface to whatever might be. It's an enterprise application to database. Uh, you, we have to develop all that. Way. So I'll, the example I, I'll use is, just a, is a recent one, which is, oh, we'll just develop the service. And then we'll hook the UI to it, okay? And the problem with that is, you know, it doesn't necessarily map directly. Um, but if you're developing the whole thing from front to back, it requires you to kind of break it up into, I'll just use CRUD as an example. Uh, so I'll, I'll be writing C, okay? And I'm going to write C from, from user interface to database. And then I'm going to step over and I'm going to write, you know, delete, and I'll do that. Uh, that's how I believe these should be developed. If you break them apart, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how they fit back together. Uh, and you'll, you learn things. Uh, the things we, we uh, in our system, uh, we talk to other systems to have actually make the things work. And I could write the service without thinking about the UI. And then I write the UI going, wow, there's, this, there's a 25 second delay there. What am I gonna do about that? Oh, it needs to be asynchronous now. Okay, throw out that service. I need to rewrite it and do it something else. So without thinking about the whole path, I, I don't get the right result. So I, won't, I will not break teams across function, like those functional boundaries. Uh, I also don't like breaking up test teams. Like the test team is in India or something. I don't like that either. Uh, why? Because there's too much context that is lost across that low band of communication. So you take a DDD about context approach then to the larger teams here? Uh, I've never explicitly called it that. <laughs> Uh, you could do that. Domain driven design. Uh, you could do that. So I tend to think of it more like use cases. Like, yeah. Use cases, stories, whatever you want to call them. Functionality, blah, 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 blah. You know, I think that their own word for it. But, uh, uh, user stories, front to back. And by the way, that makes it easier for the test team to test it because they can actually see it and try it. Uh, as opposed to horizontal layers, which they have to write things to make happen. Uh, anything else? Ian's giving me the hook. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a goggle, so. 
we'll cut it off there, and it's great. Uh, it's going to wrap it for the end of the hour. If you're quick enough, you got his email address and Twitter, so you can help oh, yeah. There we go. Our next meetup is August 22nd, where young Richard Morris in the back is going to be talking a bit more about DDD and uh, Ruby and Rails, some of the stuff we've been doing here at Getty. Um, follow the same pattern, pizza and beer, and uh, lots of great people to talk to, so we hope we'll see, we'll see you then. And uh, get up. <laughs> <laughs> Now I have to. What would you do that here? Yeah.